You are listening to Prevention is the New Cure, all things health and NHS podcast with a political twist. With me, Dr. Helen Stokes Lampard, and with Steve Bryan, MP. Hello, Helen. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? Unbelievably, this is episode 20. I know. A score. A score of episodes. I know. How have we kept going for this long? Anyway, so much to talk about. We're going to be talking about men's health. More about that later. Excellent. Last time we were talking about cabinet reshuffles. Um, my brother-in-laws and I used to describe something else as a cabinet reshuffle, but that's a story for another day. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, we, we're talking about um, Elton John, uh, tattoo oh, yes. parlours, yeah. and uh, New Zealand's U-turn on their on their smoking legislation. Um, what are we going to talk about this week? So, well, we've obviously we're going to be talking. Can I, can I do a trailer of who we're going to be talking to later? Yeah, go on. Go on. Well, we've got Charlie Bethel, who is the chief executive of Men's Sheds. And I'm really looking forward to that. If you've no idea what a men's shed is, apart from the thing at the bottom of the garden where you store all the junk. You will find listening. out. Um, but look, Steve, I'm really curious. What was Alton John like? <sighs> well, do you know what? I've never met him before, and I wouldn't describe myself as a massive Elton John fan. Um, he's absolutely lovely. And do you know who's really lovely as well is David Furnish, his husband. Oh, was David there as well? Who's just so, he's just, he's just so in love with him. And you know what? You know, I said, oh, you laugh in all the right places. And he said, well, I just find him very funny. And, you know, they've been married for years, and, and they're just, they're just such a lovely couple. And yeah. he's, we had a chat with him, and then he spoke in speaker's house to this sort of assembled audience of people from parliament and the HIV community. And it was basically the all party group on HIV and AIDS, which I and a few others run. And it was us Mm. inviting him to thank him for the work of the John AIDS foundation and the work they've done. They've raised about half a billion dollars since it started, you know, for half a billion. Yeah. And, and he, I mean, he could pick up the phone to anybody and they'll take the call. But so basically he, he spoke and he spoke brilliantly about, you know, his motivation and how, you know, he was, you know, he was on the wrong side of drink and he was the wrong side of drugs and his friends were dying and he felt that he was doing nothing. He felt he was doing nothing to help. And he felt like a selfish, useless person, his words. Um, So he set up the Elton John AIDS foundation and, there they helped so many people and so yeah and he spoke brilliantly he's very it was very funny he had this um great long speech that he kept, he kept reading and someone had obviously written it for him but it was very much from the heart as well and he kept he kept plowing through page after page and he kept kept going on and going on um and and but what was great is that it it announced it came on the same day as the announcement from the government they were going to extend this opt out testing which for those of you, people who don't know basically when you go into a and e department because you've fallen off your bike or had a road traffic accident or whatever they take bloods and they will but they wouldn't test for HIV uh, unless you asked to opt in to it and yeah. we flip we flipped that and we now do opt out testing um in emergency departments in high prevalence areas so you know london brighton mm-hmm. seaside towns basically and what the government announced on the day that elton came the power of elton um is that we're extending it to 46 more emergency departments in england and and that is so cool because so yeah. far i've got the figures here right so far that we've been doing this opt out testing for the year or so we've been doing it we found 569 people with HIV. Um, we found uh, a couple of thousand people living with HBV. And what that means is, is that, you know, they can then take the HIV drugs, which mm-hmm. means that you equals you, they can't pass yeah. it on. Yeah. And so that's how we are going to get to zero HIV transmissions. So, Brilliant. yeah, it's really, it's really cool. Elton was, Elton was lovely and he didn't sing. Oh, pity about the not singing. I mean, surely that would have been a bonus, but I'll, you know, I'm really glad you got to meet David Furnish as well. Okay, I do have, I have star envy. I've had a crazy start to the week. Um, I'm, I've been in clinical practice and, oh my goodness, respiratory viruses are definitely on the app. Uh, and in fact, did, I don't know if you know, but if you if you ever want to look for the hard weekly data of what's going on on viruses, respiratory viruses, there's the, the Royal College of GPs have got this research surveillance centre, it's based at Oxford now, which monitors all the infectious diseases and publishes every week data freely available to anybody to look at and uh, you can see what's going on infectious diseases in the under 15s particularly uh high uh, but you know we always get these seasonal stuff but i've had no megastars in my consulting room at least none that i can tell you about anyway 
But what is can... this what is this hundred day cough which it's been nicknamed? Because there seems to be UK Health Security Agency mm-hmm. we're talking about this new respiratory illness. And and I'm I'm just trying to look up the name of it. Oh, no. Bor- it's... Bordel- Bor- Bordetella. Steve. Do you it's... tell me what it's called? It's called whooping cough, mate. It's whooping cough. But it, that's it, the technical it, name for it. Boards of telepatesis, yeah. So it, it's whooping cough. So whooping cough, of course, has been around forever, well, for you know, decades and decades. Um, and we've had a vaccine for it since, I think, about the 1950s, 60s, certainly. Uh, and a very effective vaccine. But this is one where this was the first vaccine scare came around whooping cough. Um, and so there was a massive drop off intake, uh, uptake, and then it flared up massively in the 80s. And But now uh, uptake is is better again the, yeah it's called often called 100 day cough particularly when our older children or adults get it because the cough really lingers and it's a nasty cough and it's got quite a characteristic <laughs> sort of hoop noise so right. was a very good impression um but yeah and and there's the, it, there's lots of miserable symptoms in it so one of the problems with the vaccination is it tends to wear off as you get older. So there's a big push on getting pregnant women vaccinated against whooping cough at the moment because uh, we have seen an upswing. So a quick reminder, anyone you know pregnant, get them vaccinated. And obviously all children should complete their full courses of childhood inns. So, yeah. so it can affect adults as well then. I definitely mean, like, can. Whooping cough as being for kids, but... No, no, definitely, definitely one for adults, and it, it can be one of those things that suddenly somebody thinks, "I wonder if it's whooping cough." Because it, it does drag on. But you've had a busy day, Steve. What's been going on with you? I think we, 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 were you discussing assisted dying. Uh, yeah, just just say on on whooping cough just to conclude. Um, UK Health Security Agency say, looking at twenty twenty three up until the end of November, there were one thousand one hundred forty one suspected cases in England and Wales, compared with four hundred fifty. Oh for the same period last year and about 450 for the same period in 2021. So that's a 250% increase. Mm. So it's one to watch. Yeah. Busy day. Select committee um, is, is discussing um, still discussing assisted dying and uh, we will be producing our report at some point. Uh, No more. Can I say, Um, but the, to this week, uh, by the time this podcast comes out, we'll have talked to the Secretary of State for her first evidence session in front of the Select Committee. And uh, obviously, we'll be talking about the junior doctors' industrial action. Obviously, they've announced uh, nine more days of strikes, and it's all oh. a right old mess, isn't it? It's 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 really sad because when we spoke last time, we just had the consultants had agreed to take an on the consultant committee of the BMA had agreed to take a proposal out for consultation with members and so consultant doctors are going to be voting imminently on an offer that's on the table so we don't know if they'll accept it but it's, it's positive sign so far but this seems to have provoked an ab reaction the junior doctors who walked away from talks is the way it's been reported um and have announced nine more strike days as you say a few three days before christmas but what really worries me is the six days in the new year and it's sort of the coincide with the real start back to work from the third of january onwards and i mean People are speaking out more now than they have done. I think a lot of medical leaders have been very cautious about speaking out up to this point, but we've had um, people using phrases like, you know, the outcome the NHS was dreading and our worst fears confirmed. And in fact, Amanda Pritchard, the chief executive of the NHS um, in England, said at NHS England board, I think it was last week, how deeply frustrating the situation has got. I mean, you know, it's, I think we all want to see this result. Well, well, until we do, the Prime Minister is not, I mean, never mind stop the boats, the Prime Minister is not going to cut the waiting list until we sort it out. Um, and I, he obviously knows that more than anybody. Uh, other thing caught my eye, just, just want to touch on with you, is um, the government's sort of starting this legal process, which has sort of set new rules around the NHS roles of physician associates yes. and anaesthetic associates or yes. anaesthesia associates. And... They're they're non-doctor jobs that need regulating for patient safety. Have I got that right? You have. Yeah, absolutely. So they've been around a long time. So we've had uh, these sort of associate roles in the UK for at least 20 years. Um, So I think it was 2003 the first came to the UK. Um, They've been training programs in the UK for probably 15 years, I think, probably the the first training programs were started. But the concept came from America, essentially highly qualified uh, healthcare professionals choosing to do additional training to become these physician associates where they take on new roles um, to work alongside doctors in providing clinical care. And there are a lot of them in the system already, um, generally highly regarded. 
there's been a real backlash in recent days about it, which perhaps we can come on to in a second. But this business about regulation, this was agreed back in 2019 that they needed to be a properly regulated body. So nurses are regulated by the Nursing and Midwifery Council, doctors of the General Medical Council, there's the General Dental Council, the dentists and so on. Um, and so finally, this legislation is coming before Parliament. I think it's the what they call the second reading, um, which is long, long overdue. And suddenly there's been a bit of a backlash, which I'm slightly bemused by. OK, yeah, well, um, well, we'll see how that goes. I mean, the GMC have been writing to me uh, in my select committee role about it. So with that, I'll obviously get a lot of scrutiny when it comes through. Now, you rightly said that we were talking to Charlie uh, shortly. We'll introduce him shortly um, about men's health. Uh, but you've got a cracking little men's health story for us, Helen, haven't you? Go on. <laughs> Well, you know, you know I'm Welsh. If the accent doesn't give it away, uh, we mention it occasionally. But I've picked up on a great story in the news this last week about the little blue pill, Viagra. And I didn't realise that without lucky happenings in Merthyr Tydfil in the South Wales Valleys, Viagra might never have made it to uh, public uh, reveal. So, And there's a documentary apparently coming up over Christmas, which I think people should look out for because apparently it's been really well done. But the essential bit of the story is Pfizer, the drug company, were doing trials of the, the drug that's behind Viagra. Um, and it was found as a side effect of completely unrelated research. And the men of Merthyr Tidville sort of slightly sheepishly fed back that they'd noticed whilst they were on the trial drug um, that their, their erections were a lot better and sex was better. And could they hang on to the pills, please? So somebody in Pfizer thought, this sounds interesting, we should investigate. Um, and they did so, and further trials were done in Swansea, which is actually my hometown. Um, and the, the good men of Swansea added to research, I think there was more done in Bristol as well, um, and, and the rest is history. The little blue pill was born. Are you saying there's a problem in this part of Wales? With <laughs> No, I'm just saying the men there were prepared to speak up and say, hey, this is great. And Understood. They, they saw it as a bonus. Certainly, and, no, no, no criticism of them in any other way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's a no boner, as they say. I mean, oh. is the um. I mean, look. Just let's talk turkey. How, how much? How often does ED come into your surgery? When we were in Singapore uh, a few weeks ago, they were telling me what a big problem it is in in Southeast Asia, in particular. And uh, there's various technology that you know they used to. Doctors basically used to ask you to, you know, tie a piece of paper around it and see whether the paper's broken in the morning to see whether you get a, a nocturnal erection oh. and uh, whether there's a physical problem or, or something else. Um, so they, there's all sorts of other technology now that's being deployed to to test that. But how, how big a problem is it, it's, you think, in the UK? It's a massive problem, but only a certain amount of it actually reaches the consulting room because so many men are desperately private and embarrassed and just won't talk about it. And so it's in the same way incontinence is uh, one of the problems where only a small proportion of it comes to the consulting room, uh, erectile dysfunction, and indeed sexual, a lack of sexual desire in women. All of these are bundled up into what I call the, if they've reached the consulting room, we have to take them very seriously because people don't usually come to us in while well, the problems of the start they can when things are established i think with the arrival of viagra and a whole suite of other drugs plenty of other drugs are now available um then it has changed the narrative so that some men or men are being encouraged to come along by their partners uh, to get help um and having help available that was i guess more socially acceptable than some of the other options but i mean there are i think they talk about um half of all men over the age of 40 um, are being affected by impotence in some way, shape or form. And that's a massive statistic. And of course, that affects self-esteem, leads to mental health issues, relationship issues. And, and it can be bundled with lots of other things as well. Um, it can be a marker of cardiovascular disease, diabetes. So, And there are some drugs that we give out that can reduce your sexual function. So what a conversation we need to be having more and more. And I think what's interesting to me is that some men wouldn't speak to a man about another problem but will speak to a female gp so sometimes people speak to and other men will only speak to a man about it and i think that's really interesting i don't i can't predict who it's going to be who'll talk to me and who won't talk to my male colleague and vice versa but i think people men should be reassured that 
any healthcare professional, any GP is very comfortable talking about. Definitely. An interesting sign of what you say about, you know, men not want to talk about it, but maybe wanting to access the, the pill is that there was a, I went to pick up a prescription the other day and on the counter in the chemists was a box um, selling Viagra's and the boxes that were in the little display stand, it said very clearly on the box display box only uh, because people presumably would, would grab them, them and, yeah. and take them so so no it is a it's interesting what, what you say about it anyway it's called keeping it up obviously the story of viagra and uh it's on on 4th of january it's on bbc oh, One. Is it? but it's it all, it's already on the bbc iplayer so you can you can watch it if if that's your thing um let's have a break and then we'll introduce our guest <laughs> Special guest time, Helen, because Woo! it's episode 20, as we've already said. And um, we on the Select Committee, as I think we've told you before, are doing an inquiry. The first time, actually, a parliamentary Select Committee has done anything on this for a long, long time. We're doing an inquiry on men's health, as I've told Good. you. And, um, you know, we're looking at all these issues around, you know, why men have worse life expectancy. And actually, that's that gap is growing. Um, men's mental health and sexual health, which we talked to touched on before. And... Um, we started the inquiry on the select committee last week and one of the guests that we had on the select committee who we really enjoyed having on is Charlie Bethel and Charlie joins us now and Charlie is chief shedder um so he's the chief executive of the men's shed association uh hi Charlie hi uh, thanks for inviting me <laughs> now Helen are you familiar with the sheds I am familiar with the sheds because, because my background with the National Academy of Social Prescribing, Men's Sheds, has been one of those um, sparkling organisations that has been held up as a fantastic exemplar of how we reach groups of people who are otherwise really difficult to reach. So whilst I've never met you before, Charlie, and it's fab to have you on the podcast, um, it's it's an organisation I have huge respect for. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Uh, Charlie, the first question, most important one, is, is Helen allowed in the shed? She'll be allowed about 40% of them. Um, oh. So about 40% do allow women. There may be women-only sessions, but, yeah, they, they do allow women. Right. So where did this come from? Where did men's sheds come from? Was it your idea? Yeah, absolutely. No, it's an Australian <laughs> one. Um, right. the, the, the Australians were struggling with the health of um, some of the farmers, mainly people living in remote areas. And so they wanted to put an intervention together to try and stop antisocial behaviour, alcoholism, and suicide so they came up with the men's sheds i mean it, it isn't a a new concept there, there was an organization called sons of man in the 70s and 60s in the uk um but it, it does replace things that have disappeared like working men's clubs yeah. um so uh so yeah it, it's 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 the australians we have to thank for it but coming from a sporting background that doesn't it's not easy for me to say <laughs> no i would say that sticks in the uh, sticks in the craw quite significantly um, but but you know what what's the purpose of it here? I mean, you you said to us on select committee last week that everybody, all the members sitting around the select committee table, had a shed within. I think you said fifteen minutes or so of our of our constituencies, often within. Um, how, how many of them are there now across England? So um, across the UK, there's eleven hundred and eighty. Um, so it's about it's about nine. Well, probably about eight hundred in England. About a hundred in in Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, and then Scotland has about a hundred and eighty as well. So, yeah, it, make, it makes eleven eighty. My maths isn't the best in the world, um, but um, there uh, and people go to them to make stuff. That's that's the simplicity of it. To make stuff, I like it. So we're all about prevention of of ill health. You know, that's the purpose of the podcast. Clue is in the name, and. Um, you know, you talk about your health, your well-being support. So can we just sort of start off and then we'll bring in Helen's thoughts? What do you, what role do you think you can play in that space? I think, I think it's, it's not what I think. I think it's what they do. So sheds, by bringing people together, it creates a safe space um, for them to talk. Um, and we find men will talk shoulder to shoulder. Uh, and in doing that, um, they're a lot more open to, to also talking about health. I'll, I'll give you the example that, that I use at the select committee, but we use, if you put 12 men in a square room and ask them to talk about their feelings, six will go and the other six will try to find the corners of the room. And being men, we're not very good at the maths on four and six. <laughs> but um, if you put a lawnmower in the middle of the room and ask them to fix it, after, after two hours, they'll know each other intimately. They'll know what their names, their children's names, grandchildren's names, 
what ails them and how you know, how they take their tea. Um, and, and it's that having a central purpose um, that brings those men together. And they can be doing things on their own in the shed or they can be doing things in a group, maybe making something for the community. But we've seen reductions in anxiety, depression, loneliness, new friendships connected to the community. Um, but also we've seen a lot of physical um, benefits as well. What do you reckon, Doctor? I just love this. So this this accords so much. So, so Charlie, I'm a frontline general practitioner as well as a huge heap of other stuff that I do. And, you know, I was in clinical practice yesterday and I had a man in the consulting room and I I have, a, you know, I've, I've got to know him over time. So he trusts me and he still struggles to articulate what's really going on. And he's gone through some serious trauma. And for, and for him, actually, it's his workplace and he's found some work colleagues who've reached out and who sort of managed to find a way of doing this. But I see so many men really struggling with this. And I love your me- your metaphor about you put 12 men in a room and ask them to talk about their feelings. I say, to be honest, I just said most of them would run screaming at the prospect. Um, and actually, although there are some people who, some men particularly who who can share their feelings more openly, I would say the majority can't. And this isn't just an, an older age or a generational thing. I think this cuts across the generations. Um, and I think there are specific challenges that men at different ages are facing, whether it's younger men coping with huge insecurities, loneliness about having relocated and left home, um, often a huge amount of health anxiety, whether it's relationship, work problems, pe- these crazy stereotypes we have in society about men needing to be the strong one, the provider, the protector. And then it's loneliness, as you say, particularly in older men or people who aren't in relationships and when they haven't got their career and their jobs to sustain them and re- finding this huge void and emptiness. And I guess for me, there's been a, a diminution in the role of families and connections and also in religious organisations in society. And these leave bigger and bigger gaps. So do you feel that, that I mean, you mentioned 1180, that's amazing. What's the plans to expand this? Have you got good backing? What's next? Yeah, so we're just developing the new strategy um, and the target for us is is two and a half thousand sheds. So we, we've we looked at the stats. We believe you could put a shed in where there's a population of 4,000 um, or more. Um, and that's where sheds are working well. There's two, for instance, in Orkney. Um, wow. So, you know, if Orkney can have two, then then lots of lots of other towns can have two as well. So um and you know other things as well in terms of the influencing agenda. So it was it was great to be called as a witness uh, to the select committee because it's not only men's sheds working; it's the way we work, it's the autonomy of those sheds that is a really good and economical model um, to use. Um, we don't, you know, our turnover is in the region of two hundred and fifty thousand at the moment a year, um, and. You know, that's I was talking to somebody from Red Cross yesterday who were quite surprised of how small that is yeah. to to other national charities <laughs> with the reach. I mean, we don't fund the sheds. We do help them. You know, we've part of our role is to try and support them in areas of fundraising or, or others uh, around health, particularly coordination policies, setting up. Um, but it's um, it's also to to build that that resource and and the support that we give to sheds. So sheds get a lot of discounts through us. We're able to broker those relationships. But there's other bits of support that sheds receive as well. And and we're looking at how we can add more value to those those people that are running the sheds because yeah. they need support as well. Um, and, and we need more of them. Sheds, many sheds are at capacity. Um, Is there space for health? I mean, you've talked about the loneliness side of it, and certainly I've seen it from the mental health point of view. And, and I see it as a really great help in terms of suicide reduction. But you 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 touched on physical health. I mean, what is there anything specific you do? Is there a program, or there are other areas where it would be great to have other connections to bring health promotion to the sheds? Yeah, yeah. So we we're often. I mean, I was approached yesterday by another cancer charity about uh, they're struggling to connect to men, and so yeah. can the, can we work with you as men sheds? Um, one example I gave was um, um, there's a guy who was who lost his sight in one eye in one of the sheds in in and then. Um, he started losing his sight in the other eye. Oh. And, you know, a high proportion of sight loss can be prevented. And the shedders didn't like what was going on. He wouldn't go to the doctors. He wouldn't go to the chemists as a, you know, called a, fulfilling the stereotype of, of being male. <laughs> um, they marched him down. They looked at what he might have. They took him down to the doctors. They supported him through that. He's got sight back in both eyes. Wow. Um, 
And so th th there's one example of a, of a sort of physical change. Um, you know, there are some walking groups attached to some sheds. But a, another piece that they do is um, prostate cancer support. So we we do a lot of work with different charities, creating resources that are palatable to, to those in the sheds. And so the shed leaders might introduce them at the lunch break. Um, and there's an example of a guy from a from a shed in um, Richmond that he went to that they eventually got the guy to go to the doctors and he came out with a, pres with a prescription for something completely different because when he got there, it was a female doctor. And so it, you know, it goes back to what you were saying. Um, you know, they have got him going back to the doctors again and this <laughs> time they booked an appointment with a, with a man, um, which, you know, it's it's we're able to introduce those conversations you know we sheds often have a conversation around suicide we did a survey start of the year and 39 percent of sheds that fed back it was 178 sheds replied different sheds and 39 uh, percent of them believe they'd saved a life or may have saved a life but by sending out that questionnaire to them they were having the conversations so one shed phoned us and said two mornings we've spent on that questionnaire because the guys all sat around and talked about health for the first time. Yeah. Whether that was they're worried about their wife's dementia or um, a bereavement and how that's had an impact on them. And those things would never happen in general society. It's uh, interesting, isn't it? Because when you're doing something, you're you're distracted, but you're focused. So I know bringing up boys as I am, or one boy, um, is that if we're doing something and I ask him what's going on, how, how's this going how's that going I'm more likely to get engagement from it than if I just sit down face to face and say so what's going on and that's the that's the shoulder to shoulder thing you're talking about isn't it have you ever had um local doctors go into men's sheds to help make something and talk to men about their health just casually as they're going no, not not in that way. I mean, we do have doctors that are in sheds um, or former doctors. So, but not in a specific intervention because I think it's about them getting used to to being involved in the shed. And you've got to. I mean, it, it would be a very good training point for some some medical practitioners because mm. it's about language. And um, there was a there was a guy in a shed I, I was chatting to, and he was telling me about how he, when he retired, he struggled after the honeymoon period. He struggled. Um, and he then went on from the shed to volunteer in other organisations. When the person I was meeting came in, who was a young lady, who was one of our sponsors, he said, oh, she asked him the same question. And he said, oh, yeah, I was at a loose end. Um, and men will talk about things in a different way. And I know it's reported on ONS that, that loneliness affects women more than it does men. Mm. But it might be that the men, it's not asking the right question or in the right yeah. Um so you you yeah we'd have to be careful. I mean that there could be some really good learning there. We do have some charities go in and talk to sheds, um, either directly or in uh, networks. So again, prostate cancer use that network quite well that we've got. Um, we don't have those networks everywhere yet, and they take time to to develop. Um, but it's about just getting that trust, and and it you know it might take. There was there was one guy, and it took him. Uh, about six months before he started talking to anybody else in the shed. And then afterwards, he was talking to the shed leader. And, you know, again, one of the examples where he said, you know, it saved my life coming here. You know, I'd, I'd have I'd have ended it. Um, so there's some immediate life saving that goes on. But, you know, the 30,000 plus people in the sheds, you know, there's a lot of preventative stuff going on. That, that it's great. Or know about, or never know it's, about. It's great. I'm it's so awesome. glad we got you on. I mean, what's the best thing you've seen made in a shed, Charlie? <laughs> I I I um I think there's some carvings, Tanhouse um shed, um mm. do some incredible, incredible carvings, chess sets we've seen. Some of the wood turning is absolutely phenomenal. Um the the um I mean and, and they teach you tricks that you've never seen. So you, you turn a piece of wood when it's green, so it's still wet, yeah. and then you see it completely um deform, but so you've got a bowl that's a completely irregular nice. shape. Have you ever seen someone use the side of a hammer? 
Do you, do you know? Do you know I, why I'm asking that, Charlie? I, 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 I might have an idea because I got messages from colleagues of mine, <laughs> something else I do from Switzerland, first of all, to tell me that about that. Um, tell me what this all about. The the side of a hammer. For the listeners' pleasure, the Prime Minister, bless him, went to a um, a workshop in West Yorkshire uh, last month, and uh, he was doing a visit, and he was asked to do something with a hammer, and they said, "Oh no, use that bit." And he, what the side of it? And I, yeah. Anyway, so he started using the hammer by by tapping the side of the hammer onto the nail and of course this went viral as oh my god he doesn't know how to use a hammer but actually he was asked to do it that way but i've never seen anyone use the side of a hammer i mean it's logical because it'd be easier you can use any bit of a hammer surely you use the mm. bit that drives the nail and whatever in the best way you do but just choose the size of the hammer I, that's I what, what he did what worries me is that he was actually asked to do that by somebody instructing well, uh, um, hmm, yeah. in birmingham, birmingham where i'm from originally um you know we use them as screwdrivers but uh <laughs> <laughs> Talking my language, Charlie. Just hit the screw hard. Just hit it harder. <laughs> you need a bigger hammer. Uh, so, what do you what do you reckon the future is of the sheds, then, Charlie? Um, I I see them, and we see it in some places developing into more of a community hub as well. So they're warm spaces Great. for people in in the current climate. Um, you know, when it gets cold. But I I we've seen some um, Froom shed, for instance, as part of the whole Froom project. Oh, Froom is awesome. Yeah, where social prescribing is really well connected with lots of activity. And we can see we see that happening more. Um, and, you know, the 88 percent of shedders felt more connected to the community um, by joining a shed. And I think that community piece uh, we will only see see happen more and more. And it is very much like the big society that, that yeah. Cameron talked about. Um, but, in, but in reality, really happening um, so yeah, we we can only see them see them getting better. The I'm, um, sorry. No, I'm saying I'm guessing a chunk of funding wouldn't go amiss either, Charlie. I mean, you know, if there are any big donors listening out there, I can't. There are a few things that can have greater impact. I mean, I think this is awesome stuff. Yeah, and, and you know, and the value of sheds. We're we're looking to try and get a piece of work done. It, it, I mean, it's all about cost, but on the social value of a shed, the economic value of a shed, because you know. You know, not only what they do themselves, it's when they're making things for the community, for schools. I mean, one shed made 17 xylophones for a school. Um, oh, wow. They couldn't afford any. Unfortunately for the kids, they then played them to them, but um, <laughs> shedders. But, you know, they, they do an awful lot, whether it's fitting out charity um, uh, storage areas with shelving or making planters at railway stations. So, um, you know, it's trying to see the value of that. But yes, no, absolutely. Some core, w what's difficult to get is funding for the core delivery of, yeah. of what we do and um, and, and the planning, you know, because every 12 months you're, when you're re-looking at the budget, it's, you know, have we got that coming in? Do we take the risk of continuing with that piece of work? Um, and there's just so much more we could do. There's so much yeah. more. So I've got three in my constituency, Helen, uh, Cold and wow. Common, Kingsworthy and Alsford. And I have visited the, the Kingsworthy one and very, very good it was too. And I think there's sort of a myth, isn't there, that men's sheds up for older guys. Maybe that's not true. Maybe that's true. You can tell me. And then what would, what just, just finally sort of coming to a close, Charlie, what if you don't have a men's shed near you? Presumably your answer is start one. Yeah. So um, to the, uh, yeah, to, to, to that question, start one. We can help. We have we have manuals, we have guidance, we have volunteers who will come and help set them up as well. Um, so the, the, there's an awful lot um, that can be done there. To the first question that I've already forgotten. Um, are they for older geezers? Um, some sheds are. So some sheds were set up with over 50s in, in mind. We've seen since COVID a lot more younger people joining sheds. So they won't yeah. necessarily accept people because they're worried about keeping the culture that they've got. And more sheds are looking at opening on evenings now um, Good. And, and on weekends because they recognise that demand from their communities. Um, but you know, some sheds, because of the rule of six, sheds started to open more days um, during during the coming out of lockdown, and uh, which is a really positive thing that's happened yeah. to sheds. But they've just filled up. It, it's fantastic. It's, so sorry, I'm conscious we're we're running out of time with you, Charlie, but it's been great. And um, 
I would imagine there'd be a lot of younger guys who would learn from more experienced guys, and especially the sort of practical skills you're talking about. I've been fascinated how there's been a cultural shift in what people have learned how to use power tools, how to how to work in a shed and work in a workshop environment. I mean, I, I was brought up with a dad who believed the girls should be treated the same as boys, and I was taught how to use a screwdriver properly and a hammer properly and how to put them back and look after them. But but that's absolutely not a cultural thing that's continuing, is it? No, no, it isn't. And we do find teachers come in to some sheds and ask for help. You know, how do I do this? I've got to go and teach it. I've never yeah. been, you know, one of the skills. And we have some sheds that go and support um, listed buildings. So they, they support builders with fixing listed buildings. And we're looking to possibly do a project with the National Trust where we, we embed sheds in their properties and to help with the maintenance. Fantastic. That's, you know, in discussions at the moment. So, Love it. I love it. It's brilliant. We're so glad you come on. Thank you. Mensheds.org.uk. And I'm sure you can find them on social media. And, uh, you know, go to a check out a shed near you. You might find Charlie in there using a hammer the right way around. You never know. (laughs) Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, Thanks, Charlie. Bye. Bye. Hey, Charlie. Charlie Bethel, shoulder to shoulder, Helen. He's all right. I love with it. Me. It was great. Really loved that. I love the shoulder to shoulder uh, descriptor. I think that's so appropriate. And uh, I was just, just thinking about my husband and his shed. Oh, he loves his shed. He really does. It's, oh, I should call it his workshop. He's even got the floor painted with floor paint so that you know, there's no dust and things. It's, it's a, a work of art. It's wonderful. No, he was really interesting. And I mean, I, I just think they've done such a great thing with men's sheds. And I, I, you know, said about visiting one in my constituency and I, I would love to visit the others because mm. I find, I find it actually, it's quite an interesting shoulder to shoulder time for an MP mm. as well, because it's amazing yeah. how people will open up and talk to you when you're uh, hammering with the wrong or right side of the hammer anyway um that was great to have him on and uh lovely to lovely to talk with you helen uh we've had 20 episodes uh since we started this i can't believe it's it, we, we, we we're doing so well and thanks so much to everyone who listens we really really appreciate your support and getting in touch with us you can find us on social media you can email podcast at stevebryan.com i think this is our last episode before christmas it, it is so let me throw in the gp bit before christmas Get your prescriptions ordered early because, you know, your GP surgery will be closed over the bank holidays and it's always a last minute scramble. Please look after yourselves. Infectious diseases are on the rise. And if if prevention is the need care, then you can prevent many infectious diseases by taking some of the precautions that we did during the pandemic. If you've got a stinky cold, please keep away from other people. Keep your hands washed and clean. And most of all, have a lot of fun over the festive period, but do it with a little hint of moderation. Okay, well, thanks for your company this year, Helen, and everyone listening. And, um, you know, God bless and happy Christmas. Happy New Year. Yeah, have a great one, everybody. And we'll see you in 2024. Bye. Bye.